let's start with our first research paper, and that is going to be given by Markman Ellis, who's from Queen Mary University of London. And the title of his paper is The Poetry of Tea and the Uses of Natural History. Markman, it's all yours. <clears throat> thanks, Jordan. And um, thanks to, for the, to the organizers uh, for this conference, who we have been waiting a while for it um, through various uh, pandemics and other problems. Um, but thanks to Richard and to Jordan and to Ramita for organizing. Um, and I'm now going to try and share my screen. Uh, so I hope that goes well. And if someone could pop in the chat that it's working when it's working, that would be yeah, great. Yeah, all good, Mark. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, my paper is called The Poetry of Tea and the Uses of Natural History. And just to uh, continue my um, uh, beginning uh, points. Uh, so my research on tea um, was a collaborative exercise with Richard Coulton and Matthew Major, colleagues of mine at Queen Mary. Uh, and um, it was a very collaborative process. And many of the things I'm going to say today, I'm not sure where they came from, but some of them are mine and some of them are probably not. Um, but I'm very grateful to Richard and Matthew for their um, inspiration. So in this paper, uh, I want to bring into conjunction two, um, two of the main bodies of writing and knowledge about tea produced in English in the period 1695 to 1705, a very narrow period. And these are respectively writing that is or appeals to the traditions of um, natural history, botany, um, travel writing, that sort of thing. Uh, and on the other hand, poetry, specifically the tea invention poems of Nahum Tate. Um, this period is, of course, an important period for the tea trade in England, as it made a transition from selling a medicinal herb imported in small parcels for elite drinkers to a domestic commodity with an established and broad market. But it was also an important period for writing about tea, which saw a sudden flood of publications um, from, from uh, 1699 uh, to, to about 1740, some of which are represented here. Um, but I'm going to begin with uh, the natural history, of which I have sort of three building blocks I want to um, talk about, uh, Lecomte, Ovington, and Cunningham. Um, so one of the first accounts of the cultivation of tea that appeared in English was that offered by the French Jesuit Louis-Daniel Lecomte, uh, who visited Chinese tea plantations in the late 1680s. Lecomte um, was a corresponding member of the Académie Royale des Sciences and traveled to China as part of the Jesuit mission led by Jean de Fontenay. On his return, he wrote an account of his travels, which gave the fullest and most up-to-date account of China then known. Though his main interest was the relationship between Confucianism and Christianity, uh, a thing known as the China rights controversy. He also documented many other aspects of Chinese culture, including the consumption of tea. Uh, he also observed the cultivation of tea in uh, Fujian province. Uh, there, uh, he observed, they first made me observe tea upon the declining of a little hill. It was not above five or six foot high, several stalks, each of which was an inch thick, joined together and divided at the top into many small branches, which composed a kind of cluster, much what like our myrtle. The trunk, though seemingly dry, yet bore very green branches and leaves. These leaves were drawn out in length at the point pretty straight, an inch or an inch and a half long, and indented in their whole circumference. But in the language and descriptive techniques of natural history, the leaf form and branching structure of the tea bush is described and an analogy made like a myrtle, he says. Though he says he only had 15 minutes to observe the tea bushes on this plantation, Le Comte was also witness to Chinese tea consumption more frequently. He made some important observations. Firstly, he said that the tea, which is commonly drink in China, hath no particular name um, because it is gathered hand over head in different territories and soils. Ordinary Chinese tea, he thought, was a kind of blend, maybe, from different parts of the country and didn't have a distinctive name other than tea. But he did distinguish two superior types of tea, he says, as used by persons of quality. These, he thought, were named after the territory they came from, 
tea sumlo, he said, it was a green tea with a fleeting pleasant taste and a scent a little of violets, while tea vuoi generated a delicious infusion inclining to black. Lecomte's travels were published in French in 1696 and very quickly translated into English, appearing in 1697 as memoirs and observations made in a late journey through the empire of China. The next uh, building block, so to speak, is um, the Reverend John Ovington and his voyage to Surat, a travel book published in 1696, the same year as Lecomte, and I haven't been able to establish which, was, uh, which has the priority. Ovington had departed in uh, 1689 from Gravesend on the Benjamin, an East India vessel bound for Bombay, where he arrived in May 1690 and departed in, and moved in, 16, in September of the same year to Surat, about 300 kilometers north in Gujarat. There he remained for two and a half years, returning to uh, England in February 1693, serving for some of that time uh, he was there as chaplain to the factory. He wrote and published his account, account of his Indian experiences in his voyage to Surat in the year 1689, which was published by Jacob Thompson in 1696. This included some discussion of, of tea, because in Surat, he said, tea was consumed by Chinese merchants, by the Banians, and the, following their lead, the Europeans. The Bania were a Gujarati caste or community of merchants and traders who operated an extensive commercial system offering banking, intermediation, money lending, and financial services for both English factors and their Indian counterparts. And with them, Ovington learned about tea and their love of tea, which he described as a common drink with all the inhabitants of India, as well Europeans as natives, and by the Dutch is used as such a standing entertainment that the teapots seldom off the fire or unemployed. Ovington observed that tea was agreeable despite the heat of the climate and was also an effective remedy prevailing against the headache, gravel, and the griping in the guts. Ovington seems to have known that all the tea he encountered in Surat was sourced from China, where and in both Surat and, uh, uh, where, and in Surat it was an expensive and exotic imported commodity as it was in England. He observed that tea came in a number of distinctive kinds or grades. He said there were two forms of green tea, Bing and Sumlo, sorry, Singlo, and one red tea, uh, Bohe. He gave some further information about the shrub from which the tea was harvested and the manner in which it was prepared. The leaf is first green, he said, but is made crisp and dry by frying twice or oftener in a pan. And as often as taken off the fire, it is rolled with the hand upon a table till it curls. This was all new information in London and valuable to the East India Company, to natural philosophers and to consumers. In uh, 1699, so three years later, Ovington consolidated his renown as the tea expert in London by publishing an octavo pamphlet entitled An Essay Upon the Nature and Qualities of Tea. This was an innovative attempt to kind of methodize or bring together all English knowledge of tea by combining uh, the available commercial, natural, philosophical, and medical information um, serving the purpose of enhancing the, the ability of people to sell tea, the, the, the aimed at the tea trade, and probably with a selfish purpose too, in that he might have been seeking favour and patronage within the East India Company and its uh, elite backers. So in the essay, Ovington repeated his division of tea into three kinds and elaborated slightly on the uh, tasting notes or flavour profile of them, um, showing also some awareness of uh, the information in the comp's history. So he noted there were these three kinds of, of, of tea, bohe, singlo, and bing. Bohe, he says, generally tinges the water brown or of a reddish color. Bohe, he added, improves with age in both ways this makes it distinct from other teas. Singlo or sumlo, he says, is a bluish green color which tastes very crisp when it is chewed and afterwards looks green upon the hand and infuses a pale greenness into the water. The flavor of it is fresh and fine, lively and pleasant. Bing is a large loose leaf, the finest sort of it looks both green to the eye and is crisp in the mouth. And the smell of it is very pleasant, which enhances the price of it here in England. And it is highly esteemed likewise in China, being sold there at three times the price of the other two. 
He commented on the remarkable ingenuity also of the Chinese to prepare the leaves with so much art as to make them still continue green, notwithstanding all the length of time they have been dried. The aim of tea storage and tea preparation, Ovington concluded, was to preserve the spirit and verdure of the tea. Verdure was a word that summarized both color and taste, both greenness and that sort of vegetable aroma. The quality of being, um, these refined qualities were partly produced by cultivation. He said the tender leaf was planted in the most refined earth and carefully defended from all injuries of the air, from all excessive colds and heats and everything that may be apt to offend the tender leaf but was also a mark of its sophistication and delicacy, he said. He also noticed that tea was spelt differently in, by some sources. Some sources spelt it tay, T-H-E-E, -E, as well as it was also known as cha, T-C-H-A. The pamphlet, um, when it was published, came with a um, botanical, an illustrated frontispiece, which, has, which depicted the plant and the fruit of tea using the visual language of a botanical print. And he also made use of a botanical style when he was called upon to describe the tree of tea in the opening pages of the essay, <clears throat> where we might note, I think, that he seems to think that all, or believe that all tea comes from one sort of tea tree, which is interesting. This tea is a leaf which grows upon a shrub in China and Japan, not exceeding either the height, in height or breadth our rose or gooseberry bushes in Europe, the branches of which from the root to the top are clothed with an abundance of tender leaves of different magnitude, though of the same form and shape. For Coronius, so that's an authority he's quoting, um, Coronius, who lived several years in the of Empire of Japan, Richard did some uh, good research on this, and Coronius is probably Francois Caron, a French Huguenot, who served in the Dutch East India Company in Japan between 1619 and 1641, though the quotation itself has not been traced. Uh, Corinius describes the same tree, uh, uh, that upon the same tree are leaves of five different proportions, the largest of which resemble our garden balm and grow towards the root. As they rise in height, their size decreases, but the smallest bear the largest price. The flowers of it, which are all white, are of no esteem. The main virtue is lodged in the leaves. And the uh, Ovington continues then with a little analysis of the flowers. When the flowers, however, are new and fresh, they yield a very pleasant smell. But in time, as I have seen them, they grow yellow and being put into water, turn it brown. They consist of five whitish or palish leaves with many chives in the middle of the flower. Again, using that uh, botanical mode of description. And as he goes on, he also reveals that he has um, some research sources for his essay, which include Le Comte, but also the, the work of two earlier researchers, Johann Pecklin and Willem Ten Rin um, from uh, the 1660s and 1680s. Note that in the discussion of the flowers in that quotation, he, uh, Ovington tantalizingly claims that he has seen the flowers of the tea bush, and there's, that's quite mysterious. And um, Richard suggests that they, Richard Colton, that is, that they, he might have seen one cultivated in Surat, either as an endemic variety, you know, Camellia uh, asamica, or perhaps as a cultivated bush of the Chinese tea, Camellia sinensis, which is again an intriguing idea, or perhaps he saw a botanical specimen, a pressed, dried specimen. Um, it seems odd, though, that he'd mention it only in the essay and not in his voyage to Surat. But anyway, let's not to, to get detained by that. And my third um, building block is James Cunningham, a physician who made two voyages to China. And Richard Coulton and Charlie Jarvis are the experts here uh, in relation to Cunningham. The first of Cunningham's voyages was 1697 to 1699, when he was a ship surgeon on an interloper trading venture to Amoy Xiamen in China. The second was between 1700 to 1703 when he lived at Chusan as part of the New East India Company initiative to found a permanent Chinese settlement, or English settlement in China. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1699 between these voyages. Cunningham was asked by James Petiver, uh, another fellow of the Royal Society, to inquire about the varieties of tea in China and to find out how the bohe tea differs from the common or green variety. Petiver especially wanted to know whether green and bohe came from different plants. In China, 
Cunningham collected specimens, kept detailed records in his field book and collected images of plants by Chinese artists. Um, here's the uh, Cunningham specimen in the um, Natural History Museum in the Sloan Herbarium. On his second voyage to China in 1700, Cunningham answered James Petiver's questions. After a whole year observing the agricultural cycle of the island he was on, he sent to London a letter giving a fuller account of the nature and cultivation of tea. He said that the three sorts of tea commonly carried to England are all from the same plant, only the season of the year and the soil makes a difference. Cunningham's letter was printed in 1702 in the Philosophical Transactions, which is what we have here. Cunningham's conclusion that the three sorts of tea were simply the same leaves as they differ in season and soil may have been based on information that he gathered from um, uh, interviews or encounters with farmers and merchants, but he had also, he also makes it clear that he had made his own observations about tea trees and to have witnessed perhaps even the processing of those harvested leaves. Uh, he indicates though he might not be fully conscious of its significance, that uh, the importance of the methods of preparation or processing that tea goes through, bohe, he says, is dried in the shade, which would allow fermentation and darken the color of the leaves and therefore the, uh, the beverage. Whereas Singlo and Bing are both dried a little in patches or pans over the fire, which would arrest oxidation and preserve greenness. Cunningham's botanical declaration concerning the specific origins of various leaf teas shipped to Europe, though was very clear. He says they are all from the same plant. And that point was picked up by Ovington in the second edition of his uh, essay on the nature and qualities of tea, where it's almost the only edition he made that uh, to recognize Cunningham's discovery of the single origin of tea. Okay, now the second part of my paper is about uh, tea poems tea invention poems, um, where I'm going to just try and assess what, um, in particular, Nahum Tate made of this botanical knowledge when he was writing his poem on tea in 1700. Well, as you can, oh, that's the context, as you can see from the title page, it says 1700, but it was in fact first published in 1701 in May. When Tate wrote this poem, um, he was a very accomplished and celebrated dramatist and librettist. He was poet laureate to the king. It's not clear how much Tate knew about tea, although he was clearly a very committed tea drinker. His poem begins with a dedication uh, to Charles Montague, who was president of the Royal Society and later Earl of Halifax, and has a preface that clarifies his am poetic ambitions for the work. Um, in this preface, he also suggests uh, or makes it clear that he knows the work of Lecomte and Ovington and that he's used that material to help make the poem wonderful and surprising to its readers. Um, there's also, uh, in, amongst this prefatory material, two eulogies in praise of the poem by unnamed other people. So the poem opens um, with, this with the speaker um, in a section called the introduction to the poem um, in, in verse on the usefulness of tea for various professions. <laughs> He says it's useful to statesmen, to lawyers, to physicians, natural philosophers, scholars, musicians, and painters, for each of whom, the sons of muses, as he calls them, tea is proposed as a palliative and inspiration. Tea is recognized here as a leaf and a plant, but it's not described as such much. After the prefatory material uh, and that, that introduction, the poem then uh, sets off on two cantos, two chapters, of verse, which extend for 34 pages, and then a, a little concluding set of verses called the tea table, uh, and a somewhat uh, and a very short postscript. The speaker of the first canto is a English shepherd from Wiltshire called Palamon, who has traveled the world. On his return, he brings with him various exotic wonders, including a bazaar stone, for example, and tea with which he regales his friends and tells of its origins, or tells a story of its origins. Um, and then as he does so, we learn about this so-called uh, history of uh, origin of tea, which is in fact borrowed and repurposed um, from Louis Lecomte's history in China, as is recognized in the preface. In Palamon's account then, China was ruled by King Qi, a tyrant who governs over a court lost to luxury and dissipation until he is eventually overthrown by an assembly of mandarins or court officials. 
the exhausted nation led by the court visit Confucius, a hermit living in a cave in a desert where no relief of plant or herb was found. There, the now pious king finds tea springing spontaneously from the barren ground. How surprised to find the desert ground with new sprung plants of lovely verdure crowned. There bloomed the Sunlo, their imperial tea, names then unknown, and sanative bohi. So this is interesting, um, of course, fictional origin for the history of, of the origin of the tea plant, but it's also interesting that here that Tate imagines that the three kinds of tea on the market come from distinct species of plant. There are three these uh, three plants growing in the in the desert, uh, a gift from Confucius to the exhausted nation. Um, <clears throat> but it's true also that the poem's, present the poem's presentation of tea clearly does conceive it as a plant with medicinal health giving virtues, but he doesn't say much more about that plant or its cultivation or its preparation, which given that the Comte does is perhaps notable. You've got this, five minutes left. Thanks. Uh, the second canto, um, moves on uh, Tate stages a mock heroic contest between the gods and goddesses of the classical pantheon. When the tea first, when tea first appeared, the poet says, they fell to strife about the foreign tree, who should its patroness and guardian be? The dispute is referred to a council of the gods presided over by Jove in his residence on Mount Olympus. Juno, the wife of Jove, pleads her case by reminding Jove of her imperial and royal status stating that as queen, she has native rights to tea, so-called queen of plants with sovereign properties endowed. Minerva, goddess of wisdom and the arts, claims tea as the reward of scholars and the arts, toiling and learning's mine, for whom tea can give them vigor as they burn their midnight lamps and sustain and inspire the poet's flame, as he calls it. Next comes Venus and Cynthia, who claim tea for beauty and for women, respectively. The imaginative landscape here, of course, is Olympian rather than Chinese, with springs and verdant woods and craggy mountains inhabited by dryads and naiads. Um, but nevertheless, the next goddess who claims tea for commerce, and, uh, next goddess is Thetis, who claims tea for commerce and trade. She has commanded fleets to eastern climates, she says, and brought prosperity to England's ocean empire. Next, Somnus pleads her case, arguing that tea brings happy dreams until finally Salus, the goddess of health, pleads her case, arguing that tea can save mortals from disease. The contest ends when Jove elevates tea itself to the status of a goddess, and this is the quote here. A plant that can so many virtues boast, he judged too rich a prize to be engrossed, and to no single goddess lot should fall that merited the patronage of all. Therefore, at once, to silence all their pleas and yet oblige his female deities, in common grants what they did singly claim, and straight gives orders for the trump of fame to sound aloud that goddess was its name. And then in the, in the original printed edition, there's a Greek word uh, which spells out uh, theta epsilon alpha, thea, as you can see here at the bottom there. Goddess was its name. Now, this is a complicated, elegant little joke. Um, the, the, the footnote surprised the word, supplies the word thea in Greek, theta epsilon alpha, which creates a kind of retronym for the plant T, which was, of course, unknown to the ancient Greeks. So Tate's poem ends with a pun when Jove declares that T, thea, is itself a goddess, thea. This pun is of date, Tate's making, but it borrows from the classicizing nomenclature of the natural historians. This is something of a supposition, but it's, it's almost as if the whole canto, including the Congress of the Gods scene, the whole conception of this of the canto has been devised to lead up to this botanical pun. So botanical knowledge is being transformed in a moment like this, rendered into something wonderful and surprising, as Tate said in his preface, he hoped to do. Um, now, Tate did go on to, to make more of his tea, um, his tea knowledge. In 1702, he published a second edition of um, his poem, which uh, included, um, the poem remained the same. In fact, it uses the same setup type and forms from the first edition, uh, but it now has a more extended preface, eight pages long, and an additional 10 pages of material at the end entitled an account of the nature and virtues of tea with directions for the use of it for health. And yeah, in, I have to ask you to start wrapping up. Yeah, this is the final point. 
This is an important innovation because in it, he makes clear that he has also read uh, that account by Pecklin I mentioned before, Theoph Theophilus by Baculus Sive de Potutea Dialogus, whose title is aloof, is elusive and kind of poetic. It means something like the God-loving God little drinker, or maybe um, the friend of God's little drinker, or the little drinker of the friend of God, or something like that, followed by a dialogue concerning the tea drink. Pecklin was a physician, the physician to the King of Denmark, um, and uh, Tate defends uh, providing such a long uh, abstract of it by saying that it was written in Latin, printed beyond the seas, and very few copies of it were in England. So Tate's paratext in these uh, sections at the end of his poem shows that he had read Ovington and Pecklin, perhaps not uh, uh, Cunningham, and the poem itself um, was unchanged by those, but the poem provides these fictional invention narratives for tea, one Chinese and other classical and Roman both do a lot to elevate tea and to clarify that it is an elite drink, polite and civilizing, as well as sanative and healthful. Um, so in conclusion, um, that's my uh, timeline of the accounts I've been talking about from 1696 to 1705, which we then add Pecklin into. Um, in conclusion, um, I've written before about how tea occupied five different distinct knowledge formations in Britain at the turn of the 18th century. It's a tree or bush, the subject of cultivation in China, it's a leaf, subject to a series of artisanal processes in China. It's a commodity, subject to sale in China, transportation and resale uh, in Europe. It's a beverage, a cup of tea, subject to advice for its preparation. And it's an event at the tea table, the subject of the narrative of sociable encounters. And each of those are historically complex events, of course. The poetry bears most particularly on the latter end of that list, the sociable encounter of tea drinking perhaps even the preparation of the tea beverage. The poets don't add much at all to the natural history, but they arguably make an important contribution to how tea is consumed in Britain and Europe, defining demand, scripting consumption, as it becomes a commodity of widespread domestic consumer desire. Making tea more popular, they, say, they, they claim, need not make it more, make it less refined. And that's it. Thank you very much. Jordan, would you like me to read out the questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, we have a few questions in the Q&A box. I'm just going to read them out for everyone else. Uh, the first one is from Gary Sprandell. How do Orvington's classifications of tea align with our current categorizations of tea? Um, I'm just trying to unshare, stop share. That's what I wanted to sure. do. Okay, there we go. Right. Um, how do, they, how do they align? They don't align at all, as far as I'm aware, although we're going to hear more about Bohe as we go on over the next three days, which I think Bohe comes to be a very important and dominant um, variety of tea later in the 18th century um, and um, uh, arguably changes quite a lot over the history of that period. Um, uh, the three varieties that um, that Ovington identifies um, were important for the rest of the 18th century. They were joined by others, including Pico and Congu, quite quickly. So for most of the 18th century, the varieties of tea available on the market in Britain um, settled to these a, a relatively small number of, of kinds. Those kinds might have changed over the period. There was an important feedback loop between what was desired in Britain by consumers and what was sold as those, those teas in China. But again, I hope we might also learn more about that over the next um, few weeks, uh, so a few days, sorry. I hope that's an answer. Thanks, Mark. Um, Samuel would like to know, uh, what was the meaning of Bohea tea? After a quick search, he found that it was a simplification of Fujian slash Wuyi teas. Well, that's a widely um, held hypothesis. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to finding out more about that over the next three days as well. Um, yeah, the, so the idea is that Bohe is a kind of transliteration, a misheard transliteration of a word in um, Fujian dialect um, of, um, a, of a, a kind of tea or preparation of tea or something about tea. That name then sticks to the product and the product might change as consumers in Britain um, desire different qualities in the tea that they want. And um, Bohe, whatever it is, becomes now becomes the biggest tea product 
uh, uh, in from China in Britain. Um, so it becomes a really important commodity in, in China. But I don't think we, we should get stuck on it being a particular kind of tea um, across across from the period we're talking about in my paper through to uh, the late 18th century, let alone the modern period. But again, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more, more uh, expert opinion about that over the coming uh, days. Right. Alistair Watt, uh, is Singlo tea the same as Sunglo tea, as in Robert Fortune? I'm going to say the same answer. It's certainly the same word, and it's referring to something which has a market in Britain, but it's not clear to me that it would, could be um, exactly the same uh, uh, thing. Um, it's a commodity made from the um, from Camellia Sinensis <laughs> um, with that title, like a brand maybe might be a better way of thinking of it than, than ex the exact same thing. But I mean, again, I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people think about that over the next um, few days. So um, I think that's exactly the kind of thing which we might um, get a, a lot more precision about over the, over the coming period. Richard, uh, Jordan, sorry. Oh yeah, um, you're quite right. We're gonna hear a lot about um, tea's botany or the botany of tea. So I, I want to kind of go back to your poems. Um, because one of the things that struck me, and, and um, I had din, done some, some, some research on tobacco, is you get a, exactly the same title of a poem, but the word tea is substituted by the word tobacco or coffee or chocolate. Um, and I'm wondering whether th this is about um, domesticizing exotica, or I mean, is it a genre of picking up an exotic commodity and poemizing it? Sorry, I, there's so many yeah. eyes in my question. <laughs> No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think yes, it is. It is a it is a, it is a genre. The, the tea invention poem is a kind of is a kind of sorry. The invention poem is a kind of a kind of poem that especially appeals to um, new things on the market or new things in 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 in, in life, um, especially expensive um, psychoactive ones like mm. tobacco, coffee, opium. Um, you had another one, chocolate. Yeah. Um, and um, and they are a way of domesticizing, domesticating, domesticating, um, and also I think um, advertising. And I don't mean advertising in the sense of necessarily being focused completely on sales, but on advertising its values and virtues and um, making its uh, giving its defenders and promoters a kind of greater sense of its cultural value and maybe commercial value. So it's a way of that's what I was talking about when I said elevating tea. It's about making tea f um, have a, a deeper, wider, more valuable cultural context in Britain, where it had none, of course. Um, yes, and, it, and, um, and, you know, it was in competition with other uh, new exotic hot drinks, especially coffee, which was completely dominant at the time tea was emerging. And why would anyone want this comparatively delicate hot and very expensive beverage compared to the vulgar uh, attractions of coffee, which had many of the same psychoactive properties. So it's a way of sort of finding a niche for, um, for tea within culture and therefore within, within commerce. And, and it's really interesting that there's the, so my, the reason why I showed that sort of uh, image of all the tea poems all, all uh, together is that they emerge in the period um, sort of 1700 through to 1740, whereas all of the same kind of poems about coffee emerge in the decades before that, and then they stop. And tobacco before that again, mm -hmm. tobacco is uh, in the early part of the 16th century. So the, you can see these waves of um, you know, promotional poems, which might sound a bit absurd to us. And they're quite, you know, they're elaborate, they're long, they're, ex well, they're not expensive, but they're, um, they're, they're grand accounts of where, um, where these products come from and what they can do for you. Or, or not. Or not, yeah, yeah. I mean, because there are the anti-tea poems yes. as well. Yeah, there are. Um, there's a, one particularly 
directed exactly against Tate's poem published in uh, in the 1730s. Um, you know, Tate does make some very grand, grand claims for tea in this mm -hmm. poem. It's called a panacea. I mean, you don't, yeah. that's not a claim made lightly. Um, Jordan, Richard yeah. has a question, so I'm going sure. to bring him right. on the stage. Absolutely. Hi, Martman. Thanks so Hi, much for your paper, and I can reassure the audience that all the great ideas in that book were yours or Matthew's, not mine. <laughs> uh, I was struck again about this poem by Tate, the way it's divided into these two cantos, uh, one that focuses on a kind of Chinese origin myth and the other on a, a European classical origin myth for tea and its social use and its meanings. And I just wondered if you could reflect upon that for a moment and say perhaps what it tells us about tea's cultural significance in, in England at the time or what you think Tate's trying to do there with that bifurcated structure of two stories that don't really, there's nothing in the narrative is that, that, that connects them in particular. No, the poem makes no attempt whatsoever to, to join them together. Um, they're offered as two separate inventions, as it were. Um, it's also interesting that he, that he, so he takes one Chinese one, which he, and he is, uh, often, um, Tate is very um, uh, complimentary about um, and enthusiastic about uh, this civilized and refined life of, in China, so that it's it's that's part of his of his um, politeness uh, elevation strategy, I guess. Um, and then, uh, and it's quite fictional. So the story of the king of King Ki is in Le Comte, but he adds into it the story of the origin of tea, and um, uh, um, you know adds that sort of fictional uh, element. Um, and then, and then I guess he's looking for a for a, a European context, and it's then also curious that he goes for this um, for the classical, um, you know, uh, assembly of the gods structure, which is which is a trope which is quite well known in some other poems and in, especially in paintings where you get um, you know, uh, imaginative visualizations of um, of Mount Olympus and the gods assembled there. Um, and I, I, I had often wondered, I mean, I, off, I wondered for a long time about why, why that, given that, of course, tea was unknown to the, to the Romans and the Greeks, as they knew this was an innovation, and it was, that was one of its mysterious qualities. How could it be that tea, tea existed if it wasn't in, um, in classical um, pharmacopoeia, for example, um, or in the Bible, for that matter? Um, and, um, and that's why I think that the it's the final pun which justifies it all, because only then do you get, only with the ancient, with the Greek or, or Latin might have worked too, would it? Maybe not. Um, uh, uh, you get, so that final pun bring, justifies the whole thing. It's, that's the reason why we've been, had it, we've had this, whatever it is, 16 pages of uh, the, the gods and goddesses squabbling over tea in order to make that joke about um, tea being a goddess herself. Um, T Thea. Yeah, does that answer? Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> okay, fascinating as this is, we'll have to stop this in three minutes. But uh, Markman, since I am uh, I represent Linnaean Society, I'm going to ask you a question that's taxonomy age descent. Uh, Manuel Fimen asks: It's interesting that Ovington and Lacombe both identify a single species as the source of different tea varieties. Given that Fortune had to settle that question much later, when did the belief that there were different species emerge? Yeah, good question. Um, I think that Richard might be the person to answer this one. But yeah, so as we get, as I was trying to trying to demonstrate, um, so Linnaeus does determine that there are two varieties: there's indeed T, uh, T. viridae and T. bohi, um, and um, uh, there's elements in, in Ovington and Tate, which suggests a single origin, a single kind of tea, the tea, the tea tree, and other ones where they seem to suggest multiple origins. Um, and the poems are not going to be where that's resolved. That, that seems obvious. Um, but, and it's really interesting that Cunningham so, can state so clearly in the philosophical transactions that there's only one origin, and yet the, um, the uh, the bifurcated origin uh, 
account continues and is elaborated by other people. So again, I think we might hear more about that mm. um, later this uh, later this week too, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing more about that. Uh, I think I can slip in one last one. Uh, a lot of people have asked a similar question is, uh, were any of these poems sponsored or patronized by tea companies or anyone else? Um, not explicitly, but um, it's clear that um, that uh, Tate was um, was seeking patronage or influence um, amongst the directors of the East India Company. Um, Peter uh, Matteau, um, uh, who I also wanted to talk about, but uh, decided there wasn't enough space. Um, Peter Matteau was a tea, was a tea broker himself. He ran a, he had a tea shop, and um, uh, he knew a lot about tea. So presumably, his poem and praise of tea was also very explicitly part of advertising for his, um, his own tea company. Um, and there's an interesting paper to be written about the tea orders that he made, in, uh, which was recorded in the East India Company ledgers in the British Library. Um, uh, but that was not this paper, that's another paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we can stop right on time. Markman, thank, thank you, you very much for kicking this off. And you can see from all the questions and your own answers to them. We've got a lot more to, to learn in the next uh, few days and, and also later on today. And so uh, thank you very much. That was just superb. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks so much for organizing. Okay.